60 Great Ghost Stories, read by H. Washington Sawyer. Tonight's story, The Shadow in the Corner, by Barry Elizabeth Braddon. Wild Heath Grange stood a little way back from the road, with a barren stretch of heath behind it, and a few tall fir trees with straggling wind-tossed heads for its only shelter. It was a lonely house on a lonely road, little better than a lane, leading across a desolate waste of sandy fields to the seashore. And it was a house that bore a bad name among the natives of the village of Holcroft, which was the nearest place where humanity might be found. It was a good old house, nevertheless, substantially built in the days when there was no stint of stone and timber, a good old gray stone house with many gables, deep window seats, and a wide staircase, long dark passages, hidden doors in queer corners, closets as large as some modern rooms, and cellars in which a company of soldiers might have laid perdu. This spacious old mansion was given over to rats and mice, loneliness echoes, and the occupation of three elderly people. Michael Bascom, whose forebears had been the landowners of importance in the neighborhood, and his two servants, Daniel Skegg and his wife, who had served the owner of that grim old house ever since he left the university, where he had lived 15 years of his life five as a student, and ten as a professor of natural science. At three and thirty, Michael Bascom had seemed a middle-aged man. At fifty-six, he looked and moved and spoke like an old man. During that interval of twenty-three years, he had lived alone in Wild Heath Grange, and the country people told each other that the house had made him what he was. This was a fanciful and superstitious notion on their part, doubtless. Yet, it would not have been difficult to have traced a certain affinity between the dull gray building and the man who lived in it. Both seemed alike remote from the common cares and interests of humanity. Both had an air of settled melancholy, engendered by perpetual solitude. Both had the same faded complexion the same look of slow decay. Yet lonely as Michael Bascom's life was at Wild Heath Grange, he would not on any account have altered its tenor. He had been glad to exchange the comparative seclusion of college rooms for the unbroken solitude of Wild Heath. He was a fanatic in his love of scientific research and his quiet days were filled to the brim with labors that seldom failed to interest and satisfy him. There were periods of depression, occasional moments of doubt, when the goal towards which he strove seemed unattainable, and his spirits fainted within him. Happily, such times were rare with him. He had a dogged power of continuity which ought to have carried him to the highest pinnacle of achievement, and which perhaps might ultimately have won for him a grand name and a worldwide renown, but for the catastrophe which burdened the declining years of his harmless life with an unconquerable remorse. One autumn morning, when he lived just three and twenty years at Wild Heath, and had lately begun to perceive that his faithful butler and body servant, who was middle-aged when he first employed him, had, was actually getting old. Mr. Boscombe's breakfast meditations over the latest treatise on the atomic theory were interrupted by an abrupt demand from that very Daniel Skegg. The man was accustomed to wait upon his master in the most absolute silence, and his sudden breaking out into speech was almost as startling as if the bust of Socrates above the bookcase had burst into human language. It's no use, said Daniel. My missus must have a girl. A what? demanded Mr. Boscombe, without taking his eyes from the line he had been reading. A girl, 
a girl to trot about and wash up and help the old lady. She's getting weak in her legs, poor soul. And we've none of us grown younger in the last 20 years. 20 years, echoed Michael Boscombe scornfully. What is 20 years in the formation of a strata? What even in the growth of an oak, the cooling of a volcano? Eh, not much, perhaps, but it's apt to tell upon the bones of a human being. The manganese staining to be seen upon some skulls would certainly indicate began the scientist dreamily. I wish my bones were only as free from rheumatics as they were twenty years ago, pursued Daniel testily. And then, perhaps, I should make light of twenty years. Howsoever, long and the short of it is, my missus must have a girl. She can't go on trotting up and down these everlasting passages, standing in that stony scullery year after year, just as if she was a young woman. She must have a girl to help. Let her have twenty girls, said Mr. Boscombe, going back to his book. Well, that's the use of talking like that, sir. Twenty girls, indeed. We shall have rare work to get one. "'Because the neighbourhood is sparsely populated?' interrogated Mr. Boscombe, still reading. "'No, sir, because this house is known to be haunted.' Michael Boscombe laid down his book, and turned a look of grave reproach upon his servant. Skeg, he said in a severe voice, "'I thought you had lived long enough with me to be superior to any folly of that kind.' "'I don't say I believe in ghosts.' answers Daniel with a semi-apologetic air, but the country people do, and there's not a mortal among them will venture across our threshold after nightfall. Merely because Anthony Boscombe, who led a wild life in London and lost his money and land, came home broken-hearted and is supposed to have destroyed himself in this house, the only remnant of property that was left him out of a fine estate. "'Supposed to have destroyed himself,' cried Skegg. "'Why, the fact is as well known as the death of Queen Elizabeth, "'or the great fire of London. "'Why, wasn't he buried in the crossroads between here and Holcroft? "'An idle tradition, for which you could produce no substantial proof,' "'retorted Mr. Boscombe. "'I don't know about proof, but the country people believe it "'as firmly as they believe their gospel.' And if their faith in the gospel was only a little stronger, they need not trouble themselves about Anthony Boscombe. Well, grumbled Daniel, as he began to clear the table, a girl of some kind we must get, but she'll have to be a foreigner or a girl that's hard driven for a place. When Daniel Skegg said a foreigner, he did not mean a native of some distant clime, but a girl who had not been born and bred at Holcroft. Daniel had been raised and reared in that insignificant hamlet, and small and dull as it was, he considered the world beyond it only margin. Michael Boscombe was too deep in the atomic theory to give a second thought to the necessities of the old servant. Mrs. Skagg was an individual with whom he rarely came in contact, she lived for the most part in a gloomy region at the north end of the house, where she ruled over the solitude of a kitchen that looked like a cathedral, and numerous offices of the scullery, larder, the pantry class, where she carried on a perpetual warfare with spiders and beetles, and wore out her old life in the labor of sweeping and scrubbing. She was a woman of severe aspect, dogmatic piety, and a bitter tongue. She was a good, plain cook, and ministered diligently to her master's want. He was not an epicure, but he liked his life to be smooth and easy, and the equilibrium of his mental power would have been disturbed by a bad dinner. He heard no more about the proposed addition to his household for a space of ten days, when Daniel Skegg again startled him amidst his studious repose by an abrupt announcement. I've got a girl. Oh, said Michael Boscombe, have you? And he went on with his book. 
This time he was reading an essay on phosphorus and its functions in relation to the human brain. Yes, pursued Daniel with his usual grumbling tone. She was a waif and a stray, or I shouldn't have got her. And if she'd been a native, she'd have never come to us. I hope she's respectable, said Michael. Respectable? That's the only fault she has, poor thing. She's too good for the place. She'd never been in service before. But she says she's willing to work, and I dare say my old woman will be able to break her in. Her father was a small tradesman in Yarmouth. He died a month ago and left this poor thing homeless. Mrs. Midge at Holcroft is her aunt, and she said to the girl, Come and stay with me till I get a place. And the girl has been staying with Mrs. Midge for the last three weeks, trying to hear of a place. And when Mrs. Midge heard my missus wanted a girl to help, she thought it would be a very thing for her niece Maria. Luckily, Maria had heard nothing about this house, and so the poor innocent dropped me a curtsy and said she'd be thankful to come and would do her best to learn her duty. She had an easy time of it with her father, who educated her above her station, like a fool that he was, growled Daniel. By your own account, I'm afraid you've made a bad bargain, said Michael. You won't want a young lady to clean kettles and pans. If she was a young duchess, my old woman would make her work, retorted Skegg decisively. And pray, where are you going to put this girl? asked Mr. Boscombe rather irritably. I can't have a strange young woman tramping up and down the passages outside my room. You know I, what a wretched sleeper I am, Skegg. A mouse behind the wainscot is enough to wake me. I thought of that, answered the butler with his look of ineffable wisdom. I'm not going to put her on your floor. She's going to sleep in the attics. Which room? The big one at the north end of the house. That's the only ceiling that doesn't let water. And she might as well sleep in a shower bath as in any of the other attics. That room at the north end, repeated Michael Bascom thoughtfully. Isn't that? Of course it is, snapped Skegg but she doesn't know anything about it. Mr. Boscombe went back to his books and forgot all about the orphan from Yarmouth until one morning on entering his study he was startled by the appearance of a strange girl in a neat black and white cotton gown, busy dusting the volumes which were stacked in blocks upon his spacious writing table and doing it with such deft and careful hands that he had no inclination to be angry about this unwanted liberty. Old Mrs. Skegg had religiously refrained from all such dusting on the plea that she did not wish to interfere with the master's ways. One of the master's ways, therefore, had been to inhale a good deal of dust in the course of his studies. The girl was a slim little thing, with a pale and somewhat old-fashioned face, flaxen hair braided under a neat muslin cap, a very fair complexion, and light blue eyes. They were the lightest blue eyes Michael Boscombe had ever seen, but there was a sweetness and a gentleness in her expression that atoned for their insipid color. "'I hope you do not object to my dusting your books, sir,' she said, dropping a curtsy. She spoke with a quaint precision, which struck Michael Boscombe as a pretty thing in its way. No, I don't object to cleanliness, as long as my books and papers are not disturbed. If you take a volume from my desk, replace it on the spot you took it from. That's all I ask. I will be very careful, sir. When did you come here? Only this morning, sir. The student seated himself at his desk, and the girl withdrew, drifting out of the room as noiselessly as a flower blown across a threshold. Michael Boscombe looked at her curiously. He had seen very little of youthful womanhood in his dry-as-dust career, and he wondered at this girl as a creature of a species hitherto unknown to him. How fairly and delicately she was fashioned, what a translucent skin, what soft and pleasing accents issued from those rose-tinted lips. 
A pretty thing, assuredly, this kitchen wench. A pity that in all this busy world there could be no better work found for her than the scouring of pots and pans. Absorbed in considerations about dry bones, Mr. Boscombe thought no more of the pale-faced handmaiden. He saw her no more about his rooms. Whatever work she did there was done early in the morning, before the scholars' breakfast. She had been a week in the house when he met her one day in the hall. He was struck by the change in her appearance. The girlish lips had lost their rosebud hue. The pale eyes had a frightened look, and there were dark rings around them. As in one of those nights that had been sleepless or troubled by evil dreams. Michael Boscombe was so startled by the undefinable look in the girl's face that, reserved as he was by habit and nature, he expanded so far as to ask her what ailed her. Is there something amiss, I'm sure, he said. What is it? Nothing, sir, she faltered, looking still more scared at his question. Indeed, it is nothing, or nothing worth troubling you about. Nonsense. Do you suppose that because I live among books, I have no sympathy for my fellow creatures? Tell me what is wrong with you, child. You have been grieving about the father you have lately lost, I suppose. No, sir, it's not that. I shall never leave off being sorry for that. It is a grief which will last me my life. Is, what, is there something else, then? asked Michael impatiently. I see you are not happy here. Hard work does not suit you. I thought as much. Oh, no, sir, please don't think that, cried the girl very earnestly. Indeed, I am glad to work, glad to be in service. It's only... She faltered and broke down, the tears rolling slowly from her sorrowful eyes, despite her effort to keep them back. Only what? cried Michael, growing angry. The girl is full of secrets and mysteries. What do you mean, wench? I... I know it is very foolish, sir, but I am afraid of the room where I sleep. Afraid? Why? Shall I tell you the truth, sir? You, will you promise not to be angry? I will not be angry if you will only speak plainly, but you provoke me with these hesitations and suppressions. And please, sir, do not tell Mrs. Skegg what I've told you. She would scold me and perhaps even send me away. Mrs. Skegg shall not scold you. Go on, child. You may not know the room where I sleep, sir. It is a large room at one end of the house, looking towards the sea. I can see the dark line of water from the window, and I wonder sometimes to think that it's the same ocean that I used to see when I was a child at Yarmouth. It is very lonely, sir, at the top of the house, and Mr. and Mrs. Skegg sleep in a little room near the kitchen. You know, sir, and I am quite alone on the top floor. Skegg told me that you had been educated in advance of your position in life, Maria, and I should have thought that the first effect of a good education would have been to make you superior to any foolish fancies about empty rooms. Oh, pray, sir, do not think it is any fault in my education. Father took such pains with me. He spared no expense, giving me as good an education as a tradesman's daughter need wish for. And... He was a religious man, sir. He did not believe, here she paused, and with a suppressed shudder, in the spirits of the dead appearing to the living. Since the days of the miracles, when the ghost of Samuel appeared to Saul, he never put any foolish ideas into my head, sir. I hadn't a thought of fear when I first lay down to rest in that big lonely room upstairs. Well, what then? But... On the very first night, the girl went on breathlessly, I felt weighed down in my sleep, as if there was some heavy burden laid upon my chest. It was not a bad dream, but it was a sense of trouble and followed me all through my sleep. And just at daybreak, it begins to be light a little after six, I woke suddenly with a cold perspiration pouring on my face. 
and knew that there was something dreadful in the room. What do you mean by something dreadful? Did you see anything? Not much, sir, but it froze my blood in my veins. I knew it was this that had been following me and weighing down on me all through my sleep. In the corner, between the fireplace and the wardrobe, I saw a shadow, a dim, shapeless shadow. Produced by the angle of the wardrobe, I dare say. No, sir. I could see the shadow of the wardrobe, distinct and sharp, as if it had been painted on the wall. This shadow was in the corner, a strange, shapeless mass, or, if it had any shape at all, it seemed... What? asked Michael eagerly. The shape of a dead body hanging against the wall? Michael Bascom drew strangely pale, yet he affected utter incredulity. Poor child, he said kindly. You have been fretting about your father until your nerves are in a weak state, and you are full of fancies. A shadow in the corner? Indeed. Why, at daybreak, every corner is full of shadows. My old coat flung upon a chair will make you as good a ghost as you need care to see. Oh, sir, I have tried to think it was my fancy, but I have had the same burden weighing me down every night. I have seen the same shadow every morning. But when broad daylight comes, can you not see what stuff the shadows are made of? No, sir. The shadow goes before us broad daylight. Of course. Just like other shadows. Come, come. Get these silly notions out of your head. Or you will never do for a workaday world. I could easily speak to Mrs. Skegg and make her give you another room if I wanted to encourage you in your folly. But that would be about the worst thing that I could do for you. Besides, she tells me that all the other rooms on the floor are damp, and no doubt, if she shifted you into one of them, you would discover another shadow in another corner and get rheumatism into the bargain. Now, my good girl, you must try to prove yourself the better for a superior education. I will do my best, sir, Maria answered meekly, dropping a curtsy. Maria went back to the kitchen, sorely depressed. It was a dreary life she led at Wild Heath Grange, dreary by day, awful by night. For the vague burden of the shapeless shadow, which seemed so slight a matter for the elderly scholar, were unspeakably terrible to her. Nobody had told her that the house was haunted, and yet she walked about those echoing passages wrapped round by a cloud of fear. She had no pity from Daniel Skegg or his wife. Those two pious souls had made up their minds that the character of the house should be upheld, so far as Maria went. To her, as a foreigner, the Grange should be maintained to be an immaculate dwelling, tainted by no sulfurous blast from the underworld. A willing, biddable girl had become a necessary element in the existence of Mrs. Skegg. That girl had been found, and that girl must be kept. Any fancies of a supernatural character must be put down with a high hand. Ghosts indeed, cried the amiable Skegg. Read your Bible, Maria, and don't talk no more about ghosts. There are ghosts in the Bible, said Maria with a shiver at the recollection of certain awful passages in the scriptures that the she knew so well. Ah, now they're in their right place, or they wouldn't have been there, retorted Mrs. Skegg. You ain't a-going to pick holes in your Bible, I hope, Maria, at your time of life. Maria sat down quietly in her corner by the kitchen fire and turned over the leaves of her dead father's Bible till she came to the chapters they two had loved best and oftenest read together. He had been a simple-minded, straightforward man, the Yarmouth cabinet maker, a man full of aspirations after good, innately refined, instinctively religious. He and his motherless girl had spent their lives together in the neat little home which Maria had so soon learnt to cherish and beautify, and they loved each other with an almost romantic love. They had had the same tastes, the same ideas, 
Very little had sufficed to make them happy, but inexorable death parted father from daughter, and in one of those sharp, sudden partings, which are like the shock of an earthquake, instantaneous ruin, desolation, and despair. Maria's fragile form had bent before the tempest. She had lived through a trouble that might have crushed a stronger nature. Her deep religious convictions, her belief that this cruel parting would not be forever, had sustained her. She faced life and its cares and duties with a gentle patience, which was the noblest form of courage. Michael Bascom told himself that the servant girl's foolish fancy about the room that had been given her was not a matter of serious consideration, yet the idea dwelt in his mind unpleasantly and disturbed him at his labors. The exact science require a complete power of the man's brain, his utmost attention, and on this particular evening Michael found that he was only giving his work a part of his attention. The girl's pale face, the girl's tremulous tones, thrust themselves into the foreground of his thoughts. He closed his book with a fretful sigh, wheeled his large armchair round to the fire, and gave himself up to contemplation. To attempt to study with so disturbed a mind was useless. It was a dull gray evening, early in November. The student's reading lamp was lighted, but the shutters were not yet shut nor the curtains drawn, and he could see in the leaden sky outside his windows the fir tree's tops tossing in an angry wind. He could hear the wintry blast whistling amongst the gables before it rushed off seaward with a savage howl that sounded like a war whoop. Michael Boscombe shivered and drew nearer the fire. It's childish, foolish nonsense, he said to himself, yet... It's strange that she should have that fancy about the shadow. For they say that Anthony Boscombe destroyed himself in that room. I remember hearing it when I was a boy, from the old servant whose mother was a housekeeper in the great house at Anthony's time. I never heard how he died, poor fellow, whether he poisoned himself, shot himself, cut his throat but I've been told it was in that room. Old Skegg has heard it too. I could see that in his manner when he told me the girls to sleep there. He sat for a long time, till the gray of the evening outside his study, his windows changed to the black of night, and the war whoop of the wind died away to a low, complaining murmur. He sat looking into the fire, letting his thoughts wander back to the past and the traditions that he had heard in his boyhood. That was a sad, foolish story of his uncle, Anthony Boscombe, the pitiful story of a wasted fortune and a wasted life, a riotous collegiate career at Cambridge, a racing stable at Newmarket, an imprudent marriage, a dissipated life in London, a runaway wife, an estate forfeited to Jew moneylenders, and then the fatal end. Michael had often heard that dismal story, how, when Anthony Boscombe's fair false wife had left him, when his credit was exhausted and his friends had grown tired of him, and all was gone except Wild Heath Grange, Anthony, the broken-down man of fashion, had come to that lonely house unexpectedly one night and had ordered his bed to be got ready for him in the room where he used to sleep when he came to the place for the wild duck shooting in his boyhood. His old blunderbuss still hanging over the mantelpiece, where he had left it when he came into the property and could afford to buy the newest thing in fowling pieces. He had not been to Wild Heath for fifteen years, nay, for a good many of those years he had almost forgotten that the dreary old house belonged to him. The woman who had been the housekeeper at Boscombe Park until the house and lands had passed into the hands of the Jews was at this time the sole occupant at Wild Heath. She cooked some supper for her master and made him as comfortable as she could in the long untenanted dining room, but she was distressed to find when she cleared the table after he had gone upstairs to bed that he had eaten hardly anything. 
Next morning she got his breakfast ready in the same room, which she managed to make brighter and cheerier than it had looked overnight. Brooms, dust brushes, and a good fire did much to improve the aspect of things. But the morning wore on to noon, and the old housekeeper listened in vain for her master's footfall on the stairs. Noon waned to late afternoon, and she had made a no attempt to disturb him, thinking that he had worn himself out by a tedious journey on horseback, and that he was sleeping the sleep of exhaustion. But when the brief November day, clouded with the first shadows of twilight, the old woman grew seriously alarmed, and went upstairs to her master's door, where she waited in vain for any reply to her repeated calls and knockings. The door was locked on the inside, and the housekeeper was not strong enough to break it open. She rushed downstairs again full of fear, and ran bareheaded out into the lonely road. There was no habitation nearer than the turnpike on the old coach road, from which this side road branched off to the sea, and there was scanty hope of a chance passer-by. The old woman ran along the road, hardly knowing whither she was going or what she was going to do, but with a vague idea that she must find someone to help her. Chance favored her. A cart, laden with seaweed, came lumbering slowly along the level line of sands yonder where the land melted into water. A heavy, lumbering farm laborer walked beside the cart. For God's sake, come in and burst open my master's door she entreated, seizing the man by the arm. He's lying dead or in a fit, and I can't get to help him. All right, missus, answered the man, as if such an invitation were a matter of daily occurrence. Oh, Dobbin, stone-haired horse, I'll be donged to thee. Dobbin was glad enough to be brought to anchor on a patch of waste grass in front of Grange Garden. His master followed the housekeeper upstairs and shattered the old-fashioned box lock with a one blow of his ponderous fist. The old woman's worst fear was realized. Anthony Boscombe was dead. But the mode and manner of his death Michael had never been able to learn. The housekeeper's daughter, who told him the story, was an old woman when he was a boy. She had only shaken her head and looked unutterable things when he questioned her more closely. She had never even admitted that the old squire had committed suicide, and yet the tradition of his self-destruction was rooted in the minds of the natives of Holcroft, and there was a settled belief that his ghost, at certain times and seasons, still haunted Wild Heath Grange. Now Michael Boscombe was a stern materialist. For him the universe, with all its inhabitants, was a great machine, governed by inexorable laws. To such a man the idea of a ghost was simply absurd, as absurd as the assertion that two and two make five, or that a circle can be formed of a straight line. Yet he had had a kind of dilettante interest in the idea of a mind that could believe in ghosts. The subject offered an amusing psychological study. This poor, pale girl now had evidently got some supernatural terror into her head, which could only be conquered by rational treatment. I know what I ought to do, Michael Boscombe said to himself suddenly. I'll occupy that room myself tonight and demonstrate to this foolish girl that her notion about the shadow is nothing more than a silly fancy, bred of timidity and low spirits. An ounce of proof is better than a pound of argument. I can prove to her that I have spent the night in the room and seen no such shadow. She will understand what an idle thing superstition is. Daniel came in presently to shut the shutters. Tell your wife to make up my bed in the room where Maria has been sleeping, and to put her into one of the rooms on the first floor tonight, Skegg, said Mr. Boscombe. Sir? Mr. Boscombe repeated his order. That silly wench, she's been complaining to you about her room, Skegg exclaimed indignantly. She doesn't deserve to be well fed and cared for in a comfortable house. 
She ought to go in the workhouse. Don't be angry with the poor girl, Skeg. She has taken a foolish fancy into her head, and I want to show her how silly she is, said Mr. Boscombe. And you want to sleep in his, in that room yourself, said the butler. Precisely. Well, mused Skeg, if he does walk, which I don't believe, he was your own flesh and blood, and I don't suppose he'll do you any hurt. When Daniel Skegg went back to the kitchen, he railed mercilessly at poor Maria, who sat pale and silent in her corner by the hearth, darning old Mrs. Skegg's gray worsted stockings, which were the roughest and harshest armor that every human foot clothed itself withal. Was there ever such a whimsical, fine, ladylike miss? demanded Daniel, to come into a gentleman's house and drive him out of his own bedroom to sleep in an attic with her nonsenses and vagaries. If this was the result of being educated above one's station, Daniel declared that he was thankful that he had never got so far in his schooling as to read words of two syllables without spelling. Education might be hanged for him if this was what it led to. I'm very sorry faltered Maria, weeping silently over her work. Indeed, Mr. Skegg, I made no complaint. My master questioned me, and I told him the truth. That was all. All, exclaimed Mr. Skegg irately. All, indeed. I should think it was enough. Poor Maria held her peace. Her mind, fluttered by Daniel's unkindness, had wandered away from that bleak big kitchen to the lost home of the past, the snug little parlor where she and her father had sat beside a cozy hearth on such nights as this, with her smart work box and her plain sewing, and he with his newspaper he loved to read, and the petted cat purring on the rug, the kettle singing on the bright brass trivet, the tea tray pleasantly suggestive of the most comfortable meal of the day. Oh, those happy nights, that dear companionship, were they really gone forever, leaving nothing behind them but unkindness and servitude? Michael Boscombe retired later than usual that night. He was in the habit of sitting at his books long after every other lamp but his own had been extinguished. The skeggs had subsided into silence and darkness in their dreary ground floor bedchamber. Tonight his studies were of a particularly interesting kind and belonged to the order of recreative reading rather than of hard work. He was deep in the history of that mysterious people who had their dwelling place in the Swiss lakes and was much exercised by certain speculations and theories about them. The old eight-day clock on the stairs was striking two as Michael slowly ascended, candle in hand, to the hitherto unknown region of the attics. At the top of the staircase, he found himself facing a dark, narrow passage which led northwards, a passage that was in itself sufficient to strike terror to a superstitious mind, so black and uncanny did it look. Poor child, mused Mr. Boscombe, thinking of Maria. This attic floor is rather dreary for a young mind prone to fancies. He opened the door to the north room by this time and stood looking about him. It was a large room with a ceiling that sloped on one side, but was fairly lofty upon the other. An old-fashioned room full of old-fashioned furniture, big, ponderous, clumsy, associated with a day that was gone and people that were dead. A walnut wood wardrobe stared him in the face, a wardrobe with brass handles which gleamed out of the darkness like diabolical eyes. There was a tall four-post bedstead which had been cut down on one side to accommodate the slope of the ceiling and which had a misshapen and deformed aspect in consequence. There was an old mahogany bureau that smelt of secrets. There were some heavy old chairs with rush bottoms, moldy with age, and much worn. There was a corner washstand with a big basin and a small jug, the odds and ends of past years. Carpet there was none, 
save a narrow strip beside the bed. It is a dismal room, mused Michael, with the same touch of pity for Maria's weakness which he had felt on the landing just now. To him it mattered nothing where he slept, but having let himself down to a lower level by his interest in the Swiss lake people, he was in a manner humanized by the lightness of his evening's reading, and was even inclined to compassionate the weakness of a foolish girl. He went to bed, determined to sleep his soundest. The bed was comfortable, well supplied with blankets, and rather luxurious than otherwise, and the scholar had had an agreeable sense of fatigue which promises profound and restful slumber. He dropped off to sleep quickly, but woke with a start ten minutes afterwards. What was this consciousness of a burden of care that had wakened him, this sense of all-pervading trouble that weighed upon his spirits and oppressed his heart? this icy horror of some terrible crisis in life through which he must inevitably pass. To him, these feelings were as novel as they were painful. His life had flowed on with smooth and sluggish tide, unbroken by so much as a ripple of sorrow, and yet tonight he felt all the pangs of unavailing remorse, the agonizing memory of a life wasted, the stings of humiliation and disgrace, shame, ruin, a hideous death, which he had doomed himself to die by his own hand. These were the horrors that pressed him round and weighed him down as he lay in Anthony Boscombe's room. Yes, even he, the man who could recognize nothing in nature or in nature's God, better or higher than the irresponsible and invariable machine governed by mechanical laws, was fain to admit that here he found himself face to face with a psychological mystery. This trouble which came between him and sleep was the trouble that had pursued Anthony Boscombe on the last night of his life. So had the suicide felt as he lay in that lonely room, perhaps striving to rest his weary brain with one last earthly sleep before he passed to the unknown intermediate land where all is darkness and slumber. And that troubled mind had haunted the room ever since. It was not the ghost of the man's body that returned to the spot where he had suffered and perished, but the ghost of his mind, his very self, no meaningless simulacrum of the clothes he wore and the figure that had filled them. Michael Boscombe was not the man to abandon his high ground of skeptical philosophy without a struggle. He tried his hardest to conquer this oppression that weighed upon mind and sense. Again and again he succeeded in composing himself to sleep but only to wake again and again to the same torturing thoughts, the same remorse, the same despair. So the night passed in unutterable weariness. For though he had told himself that the trouble was not his trouble, that there was no reality in the burden, no reason for the remorse, these vivid fancies were as painful as realities and took as strong a hold upon him. The first streak of light crept in at the window, dim and cold and gray. Then came twilight, and he looked at the corner between the wardrobe and the door. Yes, there was the shadow. Not the shadow of the wardrobe only, that was clear enough, but a vague and shapeless something which darkened the dull brown wall, so faint, so shadowy, that he could form no conjecture as to its nature or the thing it represented. He determined to watch this shadow till broad daylight, but the weariness of the night had exhausted him, and before the first dimness of dawn had passed away, he had fallen fast asleep and was tasting the blessed balm of undisturbed slumber. When he awoke, the winter sun was shining in at the lattice, and the room had lost its gloomy aspect. It looked old-fashioned and gray, and brown and shabby, but the depth of its gloom had fled with the shadows and the darkness of night. 
Mr. Boscombe rose refreshed by a sound sleep, which had lasted nearly three hours. He remembered the wretched feelings which had gone before that renovating slumber, but he recalled his strange sensations only to despise them, as he despised himself for having attached any importance to them. Indigestion, very likely, he told himself, or perhaps mere fancy engendered by that foolish girl's story. The wisest of us are more under the dominion of imagination than we would care to confess. Well, Maria shall not sleep in this room any more. There is no particular reason why she should, and she shall not be made unhappy to please old Skag and his wife. When he had dressed himself in his usual leisurely way, Mr. Boscombe walked down to the corner where he had seen or imagined the shadow and examined the spot carefully. At first sight, he could discover nothing of a mysterious character. There was no door to be in the papered wall, no trace of a door that had been there in the past. There was no trap door in the worm-eaten boards. There was no dark, ineradicable stain to hint at murder. There was not the faintest suggestion of a secret or a mystery. He looked up at the ceiling. That was sound enough, save for a dirty patch here and there where the rain had just blistered it. Yes, there was something. An insignificant thing, yet with a suggestion of grimness which startled him. About a foot below the ceiling, he saw a large iron hook projecting from the wall, just above the spot where he had seen the shadow of the vaguely defined form. He mounted on a chair, the better to examine this hook, and to understand, if he could, the purpose for which it had been put there. It was old and rusty. It must have been there for many years. Who could have placed it there, and why? It was not the kind of hook upon which one would hang a picture or one's garments. It was placed in an obscure corner. Had Anthony Boscombe put it there the night he died, or did he find it there, ready for a fatal use? If I were a superstitious man, thought Michael, I should be inclined to believe that Anthony Boscombe hung himself from that rusty old hook. Sleep well, sir, asked Daniel as he waited upon his master at breakfast. Admirably, answered Michael, determined not to gratify the man's curiosity. He had always resented the idea that Wild Heath Grange was haunted. Oh, indeed, sir, and you were uh, late that I fancied... Late, yes, I slept so well that I overshot my usual hour for waking. But, uh, by the by, Skeg, as that poor girl objects to the room, uh, let her sleep somewhere else. I can't make any difference to us, and it may make some difference to her. Hmm, <laughs> muttered Daniel in his grumpy way. You didn't see anything queer up there, did you? See anything? Of course not. Well, then, why should she see things? It's all her silly fiddle-faddle. Never mind. Let her sleep in another room. There ain't another room in the top of the house that's dry. Then let her sleep in the floor below. She creeps about quietly enough. Poor little timid thing. She won't disturb me. Daniel grunted and his master understood the grunt to mean obedient assent. But here Mr. Boscombe was unhappily mistaken. The proverbial obstinacy of the pig family is as nothing compared to the obstinacy of a crossed grain old man, whose narrow mind has never been illuminated by education. Daniel was beginning to feel jealous of his master's compassionate interest in the orphan girl. She was the sort of gentle, clinging thing that might creep into an elderly bachelor's heart unawares and make herself a comfortable nest there. We shall have fine carryings on. Me and my old woman will be nowhere if I don't put down my heel pretty strong upon this nonsense. Daniel muttered to himself as he carried the breakfast tray to the pantry. Maria met him in the passage. Well, Mr. Skegg, what did my master say? She asked breathlessly. 
Did he see anything strange in the room? No, girl. What should he see? He said you were a fool. Nothing disturbed him? And he slept there peacefully? Faltered Maria. Never slept better in his life. Now, don't you begin to feel ashamed of yourself. Yes, she answered meekly. I am ashamed of being so full of fancies. I will go back to my room tonight, Mr. Skegg, if you like. I will never complain of it again. I hope you don't, snapped Skegg. You've given us trouble enough already. Maria sighed and went about her work in saddest silence. The day wore slowly on, like all other days in that lifeless old house. The scholar sat in his study. Maria moved softly from room to room, sweeping and dusting in the cheerless solitude. The midday sun faded into the gray of afternoon, and evening came down like a blight upon the dull old house. Throughout the day, Maria and her master never met. Anyone who had been so far interested in the girl as to observe her appearance would have seen that she was unusually pale, that her eyes had a resolute look, as if someone who was resolved to face a painful ordeal. She ate hardly anything all day. She was curiously silent. Skag and his wife put down both these symptoms to temper. She won't eat and she won't talk said Daniel to the partner of his joys. That means sulkiness, and I never allowed sulkiness to master me when I was a young man, and you tried it on as a young woman, and I'm not going to be conquered by sulkiness in my old age. Bedtime came, and Maria bade the Skaggs a civil good night, and went up to her lonely garret without a murmur. The next morning came, and Mrs. Skagg looked in vain for her patient handmaiden when she wanted Maria's services in preparing the breakfast. The wench sleeps sound enough this morning, said the old woman. Go and call her, Daniel. My poor old legs can't stand them stairs. Your poor old legs is getting uncommon useless, muttered Daniel testily as he went to do his wife's behest. He knocked at the door and called Maria. Once, twice, thrice, many times, but there was no reply. He tried the door and found it locked. He shook the door violently, cold with fear. Then he told himself that the girl had played him a trick. She had stolen away before daybreak and left the door locked to frighten him. But no, this could not be, for he could see the key in the lock when he bent down and put his eye to the keyhole. The key prevented his seeing into the room. She's in there, laughing in her sleeve at me, he told himself, but I'll soon be even with her. There was a heavy iron bar on the staircase, which was intended to secure the shutters of the window that lighted the stairs. It was a detached bar and always stood in a corner near the window, which it was but rarely employed to fasten. Daniel ran down to the landing, seized upon this massive iron bar, and then ran back to the garret door. One blow from the heavy bar shattered the old lock, which was the same lock the carter had broken with his strong fist seventy years before. The door flew open, and Daniel went into the attic, which he had chosen for the stranger's bedchamber. Maria was hanging from the hook in the wall. She had contrived to cover her face decently with her handkerchief, and she had hanged herself deliberately about an hour before Daniel found her in the early gray of morning. The doctor, who was summoned from Holcroft, was able to declare the time at which she had slain herself, but there was no one who could say what sudden access of terror had impelled her to the desperate act or under what slow torture of nervous apprehension her mind had given way. The coroner's jury returned the customary merciful verdict of temporary insanity. The girl's melancholy fate darkened the rest of Michael Boscombe's life. 
He fled from Wildheath Grange as from an accursed spot, and from the skeggs as from the murderers of a harmless, innocent girl. He ended his days at Oxford, where he found the society of congenial minds and the books he loved. But the memory of Maria's sad face and sadder death was his abiding sorrow. Out of that deep shadow, his soul was never lifted.